chapter 2, what is said regarding the deeds of faith. Narrated Abu Hurairah anhu. The Prophet وسلم, said, Faith, belief consists of more than 60 branches, that is parts, and hayat, this term hayat covers a large number of concepts which are to be taken together. Among them are self-respect, modesty, bashfulness, uh, and scruple, etc. is a part of faith. Now this chapter deals with things or stuff related to Iman. And Al-Imam al-Bukhari wanted to tell us through this chapter how to respond to different sects and cults in Islam. And how is that? If we look at two big sects in Islam who have affected it negatively throughout time, and they came quite early, we will find that we have Al-Khawarij and we have Al-Murji'ah. Khawarij, their main attributes or characteristics is that they say any Muslim who commits a major sin is a kafir and he is in hellfire for eternity. So if you drink wine, if you fornicate, if you steal, if you even lie, this is a major sin, you're kafir. All of your deeds are void. And of course, they add to that the killing of Muslims, going against the Muslim rulers, and so many other things. On the other side, we have the far extreme who say that you are a Muslim despite anything you do as long as you have the Iman in your heart. So if you commit adultery, if you commit any sin on earth other than associating others with Allah, you're still a Muslim. <coughs> Not only that, <coughs> your belief is as strong as the belief of Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman. Oof. Yes, this, why? Both of them made the same mistake. Although they are far extreme to each other, they share the same concept, wrong understanding of Iman. <coughs> they all believe that Iman is one single entity that cannot be reduced or increased. So the Khawarij said, you're a believer. The moment you commit a major sin, your belief is gone. Khalas, you're a kafir. <coughs> While the Murji'a said, Iman is a whole, like the Khawarij. It's one unit. No matter what you do, it does not affect it. It, it cannot be increased. And this is why they used to say that my Iman is the same as the Iman of Jibreel and Mikael. There's no difference. While Ibn Abi Mulaika, one of the Tabi'een, he said, I met 30 of the Prophet's companions, alayhi salatu wasalam, and none of them used to say my Iman is equivalent to Iman of Jibreel and Mikael. So Al-Bukhari, with his knowledge, comes to us, and this is the best way of da'wah. I could spend hours here just speaking and talking and lecturing, and there is no benefit out of it. While if I say one hadith, all of you will believe. True? This is the best form of da'wah. Qala Allah, qala Rasul. People would immediately accept and relate because we're Muslims. But when we keep on just, you know, giving talk and talk and talk and talk, 
without relating you to the hadith, without relating you to the evidence. This is the way of Al-Bukhari. He doesn't speak a lot. He just gives you the hadith. He tells you in the beginning, this is my understanding of it. And you, you go to the hadith, khalas, it's over. So now we come to the hadith. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, Al-Imanu bidu'un wa sittuna shu'bah wal hayau shu'batun min al-Iman. My translation to that is, <clears throat> I don't know why the line is cutting. Maybe the battery or? Hmm? Battery. Okay. My battery or the? <laughs> so the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, Iman is 60 plus branches and bashfulness is a branch of Iman. This is my translation of the hadith. Now the extra is from the translator. So understand it in this way. When we look at the hadith and we understand that Iman is composed of branches and divisions, this means that if I attain 60%, then I'm still a mu'min, but I'm lacking 40%. Now, this refers to, it is the battery, wallahi madri. I need batteries then. Uh, moderator, MC. Need, need batteries, huh? I think. Transmission, what should I do then? And then? Okay. Give it a try. Uh-huh. So maybe, so that the reception would be higher. I don't know. Anyhow, so Iman is composed of three main components. Your belief very essential and there are a number of ibadat ibn al qay ibn al hajar may allah have mercy on him stated in fath al bari that the deeds of the heart includes your aqida your intention there are 24 branches so he's classifying the 60 plus branches he says there are 24 branches related to the deeds of the heart and there are seven branches related to what you say verbally and there are 38 branches to the deeds that we do by our bodies this is his classification Does, is it necessarily true no but we know that the vast majority of it is so when, when we say that there are 60 plus branches of Iman, such as one, I'm asking you, <laughs> one, Shahada, else, two, whenever you see the hadith, man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, falyaqul khayran, Whoever believes in Allah and the Day of Judgment must say good or refrain. Keep silent. Two. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yukrim daifah. You should honor your guest. Huh? <laughs> and you keep on. La yu'minu ahadukum. You will not believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. All of these hadiths mean that these are the branches of Iman, and there's so many of them. <laughs> it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah on the Day of Judgment to travel without a mahram. Hadith. So this is also part of the branch of the Iman, which means if you manage to achieve all these branches of Iman, then you are a full fledged mu'min if you fail you're a muslim and you're a mu'min but you have discrepancies that you have to fix and this is why it is essential for us to understand the meaning of iman because i can see someone 
who is a government official and he lies and he betrays and he steals and he embezzles and he does all heinous and bad things but he's still what he's still a muslim what do we think of him the vast majority would think he's a kafir why he made so many sins he did many wrongdoings so i will take him out of the fold of islam ah wait be careful this is the doing of the khawarij while you go to him and ask him he said i'm a believer i'm a muslim i can do anything because i have iman in my heart ah now you're following the murji'a so you the best way is the way of the salaf the best way is the way of the prophet والسلام, where we can understand and relate to his religion. Number three. Chapter three. A Muslim is the one who avoids harming Muslims with his tongue and hands. Narrated Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a Muslim is the one who avoids harming Muslims with his tongue and hands. And a muhajir immigrant is the one who gives up, abandons all what Allah has forbidden. Okay, this hadith defines al-Muslim. So part of iman is you have to be a Muslim. So what is Islam? We spoke about the pillars. Is that Islam alone? No. Ibn Bukhari tells us, don't be confused. In principle, what appears to the Muslims, there are five pillars. We've mentioned it in Hadith Ibn Umar, which took us the first period of this session. In practical, Islam is a number of different things as well. Essentially, that a proper real Muslim has to do what is in the Hadith. Islam comes from the word submission. Islam to surrender your will to Allah Azza wa Jal. It also comes from salam, which is peace. So a Muslim who does not transmit peace to others, especially and specifically to Muslims. And this is not, does the pointer have a laser beam, whatever? So I can burn this. I always wanted one like this. So, I cannot... They tell me I have to stay here. Because beyond that I'll burn. So Muslims... Is it intended only for Muslims? So one says, okay, a Muslim is the one who avoids harming only Muslims. But Kafir, I can step on them. I can take their money. No, be careful. This is given, as the scholars say, as al-ghalib, the majority. But it does not exclude non-Muslims. Even the non-Muslims, you have to refrain from harming or uh, uh, doing things bad to them. So a proper Muslim is the one who does not harm others. And the means of harming others, either verbally or through actions. The one in your heart is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Can I harm people with my heart? Maybe. Yes? Such as envy. If I'm envious and I envy people, say, oh Allah, he doesn't deserve this uh, beautiful car he has. Uh, it's shame. He shouldn't. Then, or you give him a, a, an evil eye. All of a sudden, he's having a, an accident. This is haram. Although I did not say anything. But it's in my heart. Hatred. Grudges. All of these negative feelings are harmful. But what concerns the Muslims most is what you say and what you do. So... 
what harm can I give people with my tongue? Oh, I can burn buildings with my tongue. I can destroy marriages. I can cause enmity. I can make wars between countries by a single word. This tongue has great weight. With this tongue, you can enter paradise by saying, La ilaha illallah. And with it, you can enter hell by saying the word of blasphemy. With it, I can get married. When I say to the father of the girl, when he says, I give you my daughter in marriage, I say, I accept. And I can separate from my wife when I say to her, I divorce you. One word. That's the job. So the Prophet is telling us, alayhi salatu wasalam, in order for you to be a true, real, practicing Muslim, to fulfill your Islam, to reach the highest levels of Iman, you must refrain from swearing at people, cursing them, backbiting them, causing namima between them, lying, breaking your promises, all the things that are done with your tongue when you talk. And this is why the Prophet والسلام, when teaching Mu'adh ibn Jabal, and he told him, you have to do jihad, you have to do prayer, you have to do this, you have to do that. At the conclusion, he said, shall I tell you something that sum summarizes all the previous? He said, yes, of course. He said, refrain this. And the Prophet held his tongue. Stop this from doing harm. So Mu'ad said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, are we accountable for what we say? Because we think that chit-chatting is, is okay. No, there's no sin in it. We just sit for six, seven hours talking about people, backbiting. What's the problem? In Arabic, we call it al-kalam ma'ale jumruk. Jumruk is the customs you pay when you get imports from abroad. It's the taxes you pay. So we have a saying in Arabic that speech has no taxes. You can speak as much as you... That, nowadays, yes, you do. They'll, take, they'll put you in jail if you speak something bad. So that's why we always refrain. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, I felt the heat. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, thakiratka ummuka ya Mu'ad. May Allah make your mother lose you. And this is not intended literally. The Prophet is not saying, may you die. This is something that is said in Arabic. And it's not intended. May Allah make your mother lose you and make you die. And she loses you. What throws people on their faces in hellfire except what they say? It is very, very dangerous thing to do. And we have so many things about that, but I think that we do not have time. So we move on to the hands. Is it literally the hands or your actions? No, what is meant is your actions. So in Islam, anything you do or act, whether you do it by hands or by your feet or by your gesture. Someone is telling me, uh, Sheikh, do you know Sheikh so-and-so? And I say, <laughs> this is action. It's sufficient. I don't have to do anything. Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. The Prophet was talking to her and saying, Safiya, which is other wife, <coughs> who was very beautiful, she was Jew and became Muslim. So he was mentioning her name <coughs> out of jealousy. Aisha said, oh, Prophet of Allah, Safiya. Because she was short. But she just did this. This is action or not? This is action. The Prophet said, salam, you have said a word. If it were to be mixed with the oceans, it would have spoiled it. Only this, this gesture. And how many times do we make gestures with our hands? The scholars say that if someone was mentioned and you just did this with your hand, this is ghibah. 
If someone says, well, do, you, do you know this Da'iya? So and so, he's a great scholar of Islam. You say, this is Ghiba by itself. So, it is not only your hands. Any act of transgression you do would count as not fulfilling your true Islam. <coughs> so, you beat people. You take their money. You transgress against their property. You maybe add to that harming them with your tongue. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, it is part and a, and a sign of your true Islam to mind your own business. We do not mind. Oh, mashallah, where, where do you work? Sometimes I sit with people and they start interrogating me. <laughs> I'm waiting for my turn with the, at, the, at the hospital. And a man comes, salam alaykum, alaykum salam. What do you do? <laughs> I work in so and so. Mashallah. What's your salary? <laughs> Wallah, seriously. Are you well paid? So alhamdulillah. Do you have housing? Car allowance? Overtime? You married? How many wives? How many children? Boys and girls? Are they married? He starts interrogating me. Akhi, it's haram. It is sign of your Islam to leave what is not concerning you, to mind your own business. Otherwise, you're not a real Muslim if you start asking about this. And one of the great manifestation of this hadith is that the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam to his companions once, do you know who is al-muflis? Do you know who is broke? So they said, oh Prophet of Allah, yes, who does not have ringgits nor dollars? He said, no. The muflis is the man who comes, or a woman, who comes on the day of judgment with prayer, fasting, and sadaqah. So he's a good Muslim, but he had beaten that person, shed his blood, he had uh, uh, backbit him, he had cursed him, he had done this and that, on the day of judgment, they, the victims, will come. And they will take from his good deeds in accordance to his transgression. If his good deeds run out, he will take from their sins. And then he will be thrown in hell. Even though he used to pray, fast, and give charity. And therefore, when you look at this, you understand that this uh, is one of the signs of being a true Muslim and being a believer. طيب, the third part, which is, and the muhajir, hijrah. What is hijrah? Hijrah. Immigration. The Prophet made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. So hijrah has two meanings. Hijrah of location, which is well known. You're in a Kafir country, you make hijrah, you migrate to a Muslim country. And there is hijrah of actions. And this is what is meant here, is the one who gives up all what Allah has forbidden. So you abandon sins. And this type of hijrah is mandatory upon us all. As for the hijrah of location, this is dependent. If you're able to practice your Islam freely, then you're not obliged. But if you are in a country that is a kafir country, and you're unable to practice Islam, you're forced to leave some parts of your Islam, you can leave and migrate, it becomes mandatory. You must. You don't have a choice. But if you're unable, you don't have financial means, you don't have a country that will receive you, then you have to fear Allah to the best of your ability. And this type of hijrah, that is abandoning your sins, is this bound to time? 
or is it continuous? It is continuous till the day of judgment. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, Hijrah does not stop until the sun rises from the west. So this kind of hijrah is continuous. But there is a hadith where the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijra after the conquest of Mecca. And this relates only to Mecca. So before the eighth year of hijra, when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, it was mandatory upon every Muslim in Mecca to leave to Medina. When the Prophet came with ten thousands of his men to conquer Mecca and open it, then he said this hadith, meaning the Muslims in Mecca now will not go to Medina because it's a Muslim country, it's a Muslim city. So you remain in Mecca as you were. Okay, chapter four. Chapter four. Whose Islam is the best? Who's the best Muslim? Narajat Abu Musa radiallahu anhu. Some people ask Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose Islam is the best? That is, who is very good Muslim? He replied, one who avoids harming the Muslims with his tongue and his hands. This is the first hadith. And there, this hadith relates totally with the one we had just gone through. And the hadith in Arabic is, قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَيُّ الْإِسْلَامِ أَفْضَلُ Which Islam is the best? Of course, they're not asking about Islam itself because Islam is one. They're asking about the characteristics of Islam. And instead of the Prophet ﷺ listing to them the characteristics of Islam, he's diverting them to the person himself. So there is a diversion. And this diversion happens a lot in the Quran and in the Sunnah. When you ask something that is irrelevant for you, the Prophet tells you, what is relevant, what is more needed. So when you ask which Islam is the best, meaning which are the characteristics of Islam, you can say being truthful, being fair, being on time, doing this. Rather, the Prophet diverted them to what they need. Because the Prophet Islam was often asked by people, O Prophet of Allah, which Islam is the best? Which characteristics of Islam I should follow? Which are the best deeds of all? <clears throat> and he gives different answers. Why? Because it depends on the person asking him. So each person, the Prophet gives him what is best for him. If someone asks the Prophet about the best deeds and he knows that this person is stingy, he prays night prayers. He would not tell him night prayer. He would tell him to give sadaqah. While someone else asks him which deeds are the best and he knows that he gives sadaqah a lot, but he doesn't pray on time. He would say to pray on time. And this is how you combine between the different many hadiths where the Prophet gives different answers. Because he gives it according to the situation. <clears throat> Each one has a separate situation to the, other, to the uh, others. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 5. To feed others is a part of Islam. Narrated Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu. A man asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what sort of deeds or what qualities of Islam are good? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, to feed the poor and greet those whom you know and those whom you do not know. طيب. This hadith is just as I have uh, mentioned to you. What part of Islam is best? So the Prophet says to feed the food and to read or to greet 
those who you know and those whom you do not know. Feeding the food is the very basics because what people essentially need is to eat. And from there, you go up. So clothing them, sheltering them, providing them with education, all of these are good things, but the basics, what I need at the moment, not in the future, what is my essential need now? Food, I want to eat. This is what makes me live. If you promise me that you'll take me to do my master's and PhD, I say, Zakallah khair, but now feed my mouth or I will die. She said, yeah, yeah, but I'm giving you PhD to the best. You yeah, akhi, not now. I want to eat. This is the basics that I need. So in Islam, when Allah tells us about something that is basic, it means that whatever you do afterwards, you're rewarded for it. And whatever Allah tells you not to do as sinful, anything that is graver and more serious is also more haram. So Allah tells us in the Quran, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Do not say to your parents and do not say bad words to them and say soft and honorable way of talking. So one looks at this and says, okay, Allah says, do not say oof, but I can curse them. I can beat them. Allah didn't say that in the Quran, do not beat them. What do you say to that? No, this is logical. Allah speaks to us in the very least so that you can know whatever goes up or goes down, depending. So feeding the food is the basics. You can do this which means that charity in general is highly recommended in the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. Part of the things that the good believers do, and Allah praised them for that, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Allah says in the Quran, and they give food in spite of love for it to the needy, the orphan and the captive saying, we feed you only for the continence of Allah. We wish not from you reward or gratitude. So the concept of charity is part of Islam. And it is part of the branches of Iman. And you display this by giving to those who are in need. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, keep a shield between you and hellfire even by half a date. Not a full date, even half a date. This is the minimum. So people in their homes making one kg of dates, splitting it into halves, and going to the poor said, half a date, half a date. <laughs> what is this? He said, I'm keeping a shield from hellfire. Akhi, this is the minimum, not the maximum or the optimum. What you're doing is wrong. You should do more than that. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, who gives us the ideal way of spending, who is our role model. He said, if I had Mount Uhud, of gold, I would not like a third night to pass with anything of it remaining with me. Three nights, a whole mountain of gold is spent in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal. With the exception of something I reserve for my debt, so that I would not have any debts on me. So, this is part one, which is to feed the poor. And we can go on and on and speak about the benefits of it. 
the rewards at the side of Allah, but you all know it, inshallah. However, to greet those whom you know and those whom you do not know. This is part of Islam. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, you will not enter Jannah until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you about something? If you do it, you will love one another. Spread as-salam. Spread the greetings of salam between one another.